Hello, um, welcome to another stream. Um, today we actually have David Hubert here with us, um, joining us. David has done a lot of things and uh, we met through the Agora community. Um, and as soon as I spoke with uh, David, I kind of knew that he was really humble. He has done a lot, even though, you know, he keeps it super humble. He has done a lot, DreamWorks and more in now Agora, in Agora community. So I thought it would be really awesome to actually catch up with David and get to know exactly what he's been up to and, you know, talk a little bit about Agora and Agora community and all the good intentions. So welcome, David. Thanks for having me. No problem, man. No problem. So, yeah, we we're just talking behind the scenes about like um, some of the stuff that you're doing uh, right now with Agora, but I would like ideally for you to actually go back to the early days, your passion for animation wow. and then how you got into DreamWorks, because I'm pretty sure if you're anything like me, when you've been around for a while, people don't ask you those questions anymore, but it feels good to talk about it. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I'm going to not go through the full on version that could last two, two hours, but yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I was a graphic uh, uh, designer, studied in graphic design for three years. By the end of it, I was like, I'm not sure I want to do this my, my entire life. Uh, that, that's 1999, so I'm dating myself a, a little bit here. Yeah. Uh, and basically, I and what, one of my uh, friends that was actually in graphic design as well, and he was you know, working super hard on drawing, and I asked him why, and said, oh, I want to try to get into this 3D school. So that's when it kind of put 3D on my radar. Uh, back in the days in graphic design, we were kind of using uh, you know, very rudimentary 3D, uh, 3D software like uh, Infini, mm -hmm. uh, Infinity and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so that kind of put, and so after three years of graphic design, uh, applied to the school, there was two things. There was a, a, a two program, uh, 3D and what they called multimedia. Multimedia was, was basically web, very early web, but you know, CD-ROM as well, basically mm -hmm. making a little website on, on CD-ROM. I remember and those. I was, yeah, I was trying, I was like 50-50 uh, and I asked, well, which one should I go? And and they, they told me, I remember clearly that they told me, well, if you want to have fun and make a lot of money, go in multimedia. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to have even more fun, but you probably won't have anywhere because, again, that's the end of the 90s. 3D was something, but there was like 10 studio in Montreal and you mm -hmm. apply. And if you don't have an answer, well, that's it. You go back in your <laughs> previous job and... So of course I said, yeah, I'll go with the 3D. That sounds way more fun, and you know, at least I have one year of fun. And and That's if it, it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Uh, did my class, did uh, uh, fairly well, um, and you know, my expertise when I got out of school was like what we can call VisDev, so texturing, shading, lighting, uh, compositing. So to get a final and obviously the graphic design background helped. Mm. Uh, and then I got out of school, got lucky that I got hired at a studio and that studio told me, all right, we, you're great at lighting, but we need animators. So congratulations, you are now an animator. I was like, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Did you had any training before then? Or you just got thrown down deep in the deep end? I knew the software, let's put it this way. The, All right. I, I knew the the animation software, which was uh, uh, it was Maya. Um, yeah. No, not even it, it was uh, Soft Image. Um, Soft Image. Yeah, and so that's it. But you know, I was really bad. I was really really bad at my first, yeah. first work. So uh, so second work a little less bad. Third work, uh, third job kind of improved from, uh, from there. Uh, by the my fourth year, went to France, worked for one year there. I was an anim lead, came back to Montreal, then moved to Australia, Animal Logic, uh, work on Happy Feet, came back to Montreal, go work at Double Negative uh, on uh, Hellboy, the Golden Army sequence lead over there. And this is when I uh, someday received the, uh, the email from DreamWorks because in the one year prior at the end of the project, uh, I actually put my... 2007. Uh, I put my showreel on a CD-ROM and mm -hmm. shipped it, like literally wrote the DreamWorks address and shipped it. Yeah. Uh, never hear, heard from them for a year. And a year after, it say, hey, we'd like to interview you. And I was <laughs> like, are you kidding me? What, what are the odds? Did yeah. interview, they want to hire me. I was like, seriously, I, I, I don't consider myself good enough for DreamWorks, but if they're willing to give me a chance, I will happily go and, and, and try to do it. For sure. Uh, so completed my contract in, in London, went to uh, at DreamWorks, and you know I considered myself, uh, even if at that point I was a decent animator, not great, but decent, I was just stoked to, to be there. Uh, sure. So started on uh, Shrek, 
uh, the fourth one, Forever After, basically started uh, doing, you know, cycle animation, rig wrecking, background animation, uh, and all that. And by the end of Shrek, kind of, oh, I started to have interesting shot. Then after that, Kung Fu Panda 2. By the beginning of it, interesting shot to actually started to have money shots by the end of uh, Kung Fu Panda 2. And right mm-hmm. after that, it was Crudes, started with, you know, good, sh- uh, good shots to being promoted as uh, animation lead on, on the Crudes. Cool. And that was my fourth year at DreamWorks. And then after that, I came back to Montreal to be a cinematic and animation director at Eidos Montreal. Yeah, so I that's Montreal. kind of, a, I, I would say, with this entire arc, uh, <laughs> everyone that is listening, if you're in school or fresh out of school, there is no chance you're worse than I was in animation when I got out of school. And it took me like eight years to be good enough to be hired at, uh, at DreamWorks. So it was yeah. just, you know, resilience and uh, you know, grit. That's exactly, there. exactly. I'm glad. I'm glad you're sharing that because, yes, yeah, some people, at least, like people ask a lot about like what's needed, and obviously, like um, you know, people nowadays they they actually have amazing show reels. Like, <laughs> I wish I had the show reels that people have nowadays. Because, <laughs> dude, when I saw the first show reel from Animation Mentor, is like. Yeah, that's a game changer. Now yeah. uh, I can; those kids can learn yeah. from the best Pixar and Disney, DreamWorks and Blue Sky animators. Yeah. I mean, I, I was jealous. at that point. I maybe already have five years of experience. So, but still, I was like, oh my god, they, they, they yeah. that's a new, a new paradigm in the industry. Completely. So the show real of those good schools, and I mean, the Goblin in Paris and, and all of that. You look at those show real, and like that's that's not yeah. students show real. That's exactly. Yeah, I mean, 18, 19 year, year, years old, and they're doing like work that could actually go into any feature film at Disney or Pixar or whatever. Yeah. It's 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 amazing. It's amazing. So yeah, so yeah, like I, I'm glad you're actually sharing that because I feel like anyone can actually like get into the industry, but it's hard work, as you said right now. It's like eight years of working hard and trying different things and working in different places. And it sounds like you actually had to travel a lot, right? You had to kind of move studios a lot. Yeah, I didn't have to travel. I, I chose to travel because I was fortunate enough to be from Montreal. And Montreal, even back in the day, was nowhere near where, where it is today with an insane amount of studio. But it was still one of the places, you know, mm-hmm. around. You had like maybe uh, Paris, London, Montreal, Vancouver, Toronto, San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles. You know, there was a few cities and I just happened to be in one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there was an opportunity to go work in France for a year. I, I mainly I had like t- 10 of my you know, friend uh, that that went there. I was like, sure, let's let's go live life. And it was early early mid twenties, so you know, yeah. it just made sense. But that's that definitely gave me like the ooh, that that was actually fun. And then Australia and London and California. So it's just to get out of your comfort zone yeah. uh, at first. And even if you're not traveling, anyone that is starting in the industry, don't ideally don't get out of school. Go to you know any big great studio like ubisoft for instance and stay there for 10 years just you know stay there for a little while one two maybe three project move around each time you're going to move around you will like unroot yourself and have to find get out of the box and and find a new way to 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 do things uh completely yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. It's like it's something that I actually tell people as well. It's like I think getting out of your comfort zone is so important in this industry because it's intimidating, right? I mean, you go to a studio, for example, like Audi, Eidos, or any EA studio or any of the AAA studios. Um, you go in there, and as you walk in through the corridors, every single screen, people are working on something amazing. So then you being the newbie, if you don't know what you're doing very well, you kind of wonder – am I cut out for this? I'm not even sure if I can actually be here. And yeah. especially if you stay there for a long time, then it starts getting into your head. But if you actually start jumping from place to place because you have different experiences, all of a sudden you have to actually kind of uh, grow faster. So you get to better places quicker. Yeah, if you mix that with, as you mentioned, like humility in the sense that you're like, okay, I'm here, you know, I have my own skill, my own experience. I can definitely help share and help others to become better, but I'm also a sponge and I'm going to everyone around here, even those that I I, I might not judge that they are uh, as good as I think I am. Everyone has something that they're good at. Uh, some are great with all the tools that they're coding th- themselves. Others are just have great people skills and they're fun to be around. Others are just insanely you know, uh, good craftsmen that make those most beautiful poses. 
everyone has something to to bring. So if you just go there with humility and are like, okay, I'm here to learn as much as to contribute. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, you move around uh, uh, often, then you just learn way faster. And this is how I feel that within eight years, I've been able to learn almost like maybe others would take 20 years because I was constantly yeah. just learning from everyone that was uh, around me as much as I could. Completely, completely. Yeah, I think that humility, especially in the beginning, is really important because, because uh, yeah, you need to absorb a lot in a very short period of time. And and I have found, like, I don't know if you found the same, but I guess it's normal in, in this industry that you find that some people, even though they're just getting started, sometimes they have a, a bit of an ego. And, mm -hmm. and that is actually detrimental to your growth because you have so much to learn from people around you that if you think that you are as good as them, if not better, then there's not a lot of room for you to grow, even though you're yeah. in a perfect environment, right? And honestly, in the beginning, I was kind of assuming that ego came with skills and experience, but it's not the case at all. I mean, one of the biggest ego I've I've uh, um, uh, I've seen was actually when I was studying. We all sucked, but <laughs> there was a couple of them that were like, you know, big shots already. And in yeah. comparison, one of the things that surprised me the most at DreamWorks specifically because the level of you know quality that was coming out of this studio is the level of humility that yeah. every and I think that pretty much you feel that everyone, even how proud we were, were all slightly intimated because you know James Baxter is there and you know you have all those people that are literally like at this door right there. So you know it's you, you kind of keep your ego in, in in check by default when you have this uh, ca caliber uh, around you. Completely, but, especially. Yeah. Especially when they they are uh, very humble and they've worked in like some of the biggest movies around, and they still kind of like take time to speak to you and mm. teach you, and it's great. I had one many of those moments that the people to the caliber of Jane Baxter would ask me, "What do you think about my animation?" And I was yeah. like, "Dude, seriously!" And at that point, <laughs> I was me. like, "Yeah, I was like, okay, maybe he's doing this to kind of build my confidence, and he knows that eventually that's going to make me, you know, uh, a better animator." Th there was definitely some psychological yeah. game in there, but just the fact to kind of say, "Hey, by the way, what do you think about yeah. uh, this?" It it's yes, the and I agree what. Uh, with what you said, the, the ego is obviously what is in the way between where you are right now and what you can, uh, we exactly. can you can become. So yeah, by nature, those that have uh, a, a smaller ego tend to become way better. It doesn't apply to everyone, but in my experience, uh, this the that, that's the. Uh, um, you know, kind of the average that I was seeing there. Uh, for completely, sure. completely. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, just to actually give a shout out to the people that are commenting. Thanks very much, guys. I can recognize some names. Aaron Baker was actually, interview I interviewed Aaron. <laughs> How's it going, Aaron? Uh, he's also another animator, really talented guy as well. So welcome to the channel. And Chromosome. Chromosome is uh, the guy that actually kind of... Uh, um, uh, make sure that everyone is uh, um, saying the right things <laughs> because sometimes <laughs> you actually get people kind of like commenting the wrong way and he has a lot of uh, information about animation so he actually kind of feeds a lot of answers a lot of questions so thanks a lot chromosome um, talking about that actually chromosome has a good question um, he asks from dreamworks to idos why have you transitioned to games after so many years at dreamworks hmm. yeah good question um that's interesting. Uh, well, first, the real re reason uh, I came back to Montreal in the first place was for personal reason. Uh, we just had uh, two kids. They were at the time one and two years old. Mm. And, you know, when we came back in the summer to see their grandparents, they were kind of, you know, shy because they were strangers to them. Mm. And like, OK, that kind of sucks if the grandparents are strangers because they. So there was a. You know, after many years of traveling uh, around, there was might be time to come back to, to Montreal. Uh, why Eidos Montreal? It, it's not because of the video game. I was open to the idea, but I was not looking necessarily to go in video game. It was the uh, cinematic director position that was open. Mm -hmm. Because even though I never considered myself a natural at animation, I did my first uh, stop motion animation. I was seven, eight years old. Uh, I've always been passionate about directing. I directed some music videos for for friend. I did some videos, did a little bit of uh, commercial, did a lot of videos. So 
uh, directing was something that was yeah. generally not in terms of career pro progression, but in terms of, yeah, I feel that I can read a script and in my mind, I know how to tell this, this story. Mm -hmm. And as animator, you know, that that's kind of what you do, but not frame by frame, but you know, you, you start with nothing and you kind of tell a story with a puppet that doesn't move at all. So the, the mental muscle w uh, had been built for, you know, more than a decade at this point. So I was like, I feel that I'm ready for that. Um, and yeah, so it was a complete shift. So obviously, uh, it helped a lot all the experience that I had in uh, animation uh, to to go into directing. But it was kind of a, a ninety degree shift in my career for sure. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. And what kind of what kind of game did you actually uh, direct it to uh, for? Sorry. Uh, so I was the cinematic director for the two last uh, Tomb Raider game. So uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider and Shadow Rise of the Tomb Raider. That's great. And I was also the cinematic director for the last uh, Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Uh, oh, game. man. Deus Ex. I love that game. <laughs> Cannot wait for a new Deus Ex. I, I think a lot of people are waiting for a new Deus, Deus Ex. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so that's really cool. So, like, obviously, you know, I'm into games. Uh, my, my, that's my jam. Um, mm. How do you compare games to film? Like, how do you actually see the, the two? Yeah. Um, I would say from a production standpoint, uh, I've the thing that kind of hit me when I arrived, I was used in film that it's almost, it, it's a really race, right? The mm -hmm. script is done, then we do the animatic, then we do the layout, and then we do anime. Everyone is doing their it's job. It's very linear, right? Exactly, and you mm -hmm. you go along. You're you're not redoing the script as you're in final compositing and doing the final sound mix. Yeah, video game is a completely different beast because <laughs> it, it's a software. You're building a software, and until the very end, and even after the very end, you can release a patch that's going to change the design of your character. Um, and when anything can be changed at any time, that's what uh, people will, will do. So uh, it, it felt less like a really race and more like a crazy marathon with hundreds of people all running in the same direction, but some are far ahead or, or they are way behind. <laughs> and we all know that, all right, guys, two years from now, we all need to crush the finish line at the same time. Yeah. So I would, I would say for project managers uh, to keep your sanity, it's a big challenge. I, I just have the experience of working on big, Triple A game. Uh, actually, I would have loved to 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 work on a smaller indie game with a small team that you just mm -hmm. craft something special instead of doing this big blockbuster that hopefully is going to sell like millions of copies because it, it took like a, an army for five years to 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 do it. For sure. Um, for but sure. in terms of production, that's a, the 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 main difference. Uh, I would say in in terms of the uh, the 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 artist, it's an interactive uh, experience. So a movie is you know. The, the viewer is going to sit down, get his popcorn, and just enjoy the show. And you're basically yeah. taking full control of uh, uh, of uh, the experience. Video game is interactive. I mean, there's the design and the user experience. They might do, and there's a lot of funny videos. There's a guy on The Last Tomb Raider that, hey, here's how I can do the entire, I think it was like in 28 minutes or something. Like that. And yeah, he, speed runs, right? <laughs> yeah, a, a speed run, but you know, going from this level to this level, because in this little part, you can bypass this entire environment, and you're actually under the mountain and, and you're like right. it's insane. that's kind of that's kind of the extreme but you create an a, a, um, a dynamic uh, um, experience uh, yeah. so it, it's not just what you put on the screen is what you put in the hands of the player and how he's going to enjoy it and obviously that has a major impact with animation because you're not just yeah. crafting something that is beautiful it needs to be responsive uh, it needs to be satisfying and sometimes yeah, well, we don't have time for anticipation. There's no anticipation. We're going to sell the weight in the overshoot, then it is what it is because it's a fight game and it needs to. Exactly. So it, it's a it's a different mindset. Yeah, completely, completely. I, I I couldn't agree more. It's 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 really interesting because I never worked in film. I worked in VFX for a little bit, um, and uh, and I led cutscenes as well. But uh, yeah, like especially when you work in gameplay, the game gameplay side of things, the amount of like uh, cheats, but it's not really cheating. It's almost like you know. Like the way I see it is like, you know how Walt Disney and the Nine Old Men were defining rules that were not defined before and they had to find a way and how can we actually make this look good in the shortest amount of time and make it the most efficient possible. That's kind of the stuff that people are kind of defining now. So when I first yeah. started many years ago, 
like uh, removing the anticipation whenever you're actually jumping or making any move. Everyone's like, hey, you just have to cheat it because it's games. You don't have to have anticipation in the beginning. But now it's a thing, right? So now it's like a rule. So you cannot have anticipation in the beginning. So so these rules are getting defined as we go. And because we're so young as an industry, as games, right? That, that's one of the things that was we were often talking about. I mean, animation is still fairly young as well, but it's still a, if we go back to 2D animation, it's 100 years old. And before that, there was theater. It's like, it's like that's it. 2,000 years old. And before that, it was just, you know, seated around a fire and t- telling Calvin uh, stories. stories. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, video game is, I don't know, uh, 40 Maybe oh, and, 50 if you really go, go back. If you, but, if you go way back, yeah. But as an interactive 3D medium, Super yeah. Mario 64, I think it was the first 3D, proper 3D game. And that I'd was say like... 25, 25 years, maybe? 25 years or so, yeah. 20, 20 odd years, yeah. It, so it is extremely... It, it's barely at the teenage, you know, oh. uh, year of evolution. But yeah. on top of that, you put a exponential growth curve in terms of technology and 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 budget that those Adoption projects as well mm. so each time you finish a pro- actually during the project the technology that you have access to by the end of the project is mm-hmm. is different than what you had so you constantly have to adjust along the way so not only is it a young industry it's an industry that evolves so rapidly that's it. from one production to another. And it's very dynamic as well. You know, people move around from a studio to, uh, uh, to yeah. the other as well. So all of this make it super challenging to, to pull it off. And, and y- y- you hear those nightmare stories of people that literally, you know, uh, uh, you know, gave you their entire life for a project yeah. that ended up not, re- not being not really being good, so good or even being canceled be- be- before the end. It's... Yeah. People that don't know game development uh, yeah. for sure underappreciate how it's almost a miracle each time that we're able I, to pull I, it off. I couldn't agree more, man. And it's, it's, it's interesting because you spend like, you know, if you actually do a AAA game, it's like about five years from pre-production to production and then release uh, four years, five years, seven years sometimes, like in cases of games like Last of Us and God of War and stuff. But by the end, if you have something amazing and it was like game of the year, 90 plus ratings and stuff like that, it feels exactly as you, like you said, like how do we pull this off? Because as you probably know, right at the beginning of development, Every project is a mess. It feels like, how can we actually make this happen? This is not a game. Yeah. And then by the end, to actually get to something that people can play and it's a story yeah. from beginning to end and cinematics works and gameplay works and it's just it's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Something I've been told when I started in games is that you know, you're going to feel that you're failing for super long and then by the end everything is going to <laughs> merge and it, it's going to 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 work out and yeah. and that that's a story I, I was told when i started at ada they, they 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 told me that you know uh, uh dsx uh, human revolution that ended up being a success a critical success and you know a revamp of the franchise and, and all of that yeah. you know like six months before going gold they were like what are we doing it, it's a complete failure it doesn't work at all but then, you know, every AI is gelling with game design and this and yeah. this. And all of a sudden, like literally a few weeks before, like, holy shit, I think we yeah. have something. And it's then a, a few more weeks and then one or two patch. And it's like, oh, my God, it's, you know, I don't want to say yeah. it's a masterpiece, but it's a really, really good game that people are enjoying. And six months before, you 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 thought that it might be a complete failure. It, it's, That's it. Knife, yeah. nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah, completely. In every single studio that I've been, it's always like this: the last six to three months that things come together. It feels always like, uh, like, like a, like a, a train wreck most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it works. It works in the end. The, yeah. the good thing about experiencing games is exactly that, because what I'm finding now is that whenever you hire senior people that have been working in games for a while, right? Like you, you are working in games for a while. Having that development um, under your skin makes makes you think that there's a process to this because you've seen it a few times. So therefore, like even if the game takes five years, you know, in year three, think animation especially are not going to be the best. People are going to be like, you know, <laughs> a lot of t posing, a lot of stuff we're not working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would say the expression trust the process is trust something the process. That, that has been repeated very often during production, especially in those. Yeah time of desperation 
Uh, just remember that, guys, we've been there before. We are. This game sucked exactly as much as it should suck at this point of production. That's it. Uh, and we've been there before, and it's going to evolve until the end. You know, yeah. we don't know if we're going. Where are we going to land? Like 78 or 89 on Metacritic? But, you know, yeah. it's going to be somewhere uh, yeah. in, in between. It's really in the last few months. That's like, do you have a masterpiece in your hand or you just have a, a, a good game? Okay. I think maybe on some game, especially on studio that have the um, that are making the same kind of game uh, uh, over and, and over, uh, you know, like the Santa Monica studio and the Naughty Dog. I mean, they are master at what they are doing. Oh, yeah. So I can imagine that they can predict longer ahead of time how yeah. uh, it's going to, to to work out. But other studio that kind of go a little bit from one uh, um, type of game to, to, uh, to the other, yeah. uh, it's really, as you said, the last three, six months, it's, that's when you're going to start to see where you're going to land. Completely, completely. Um, like um, here, uh, Chromosome ask, asks actually a good, uh, a good question. Um, how was your process to learn motion capture after being a hand key animator for so long? That's actually good, a good transition. Mm. That's an interesting question. So actually, when I uh, switched from uh, DreamWorks to Ados. Uh, the last shot I did at DreamWorks, which I was super ap uh, happy with, and I was like, okay, I'm going into an other medium. I had no idea it would be the last time of my career I would be animating. Really? Yeah. Because wow. when I got at Aidas, I was like, okay, um, where's the team? There was no team. So the first step is like, okay, well, I guess that we're going to start to hire some people and then hire some people. And then, well, they have to do something. So let's figure out a plan. Mm -hmm. When I got to ADAS, I literally tried Motion Builder for three hours. And mm -hmm. that that's the last time I uh, I touched to an animated uh, software yeah. because there was so much to be built. And by the time I could maybe have animated, there was other priority that arrived and I already had a team. So very rapidly, it, 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 that's that's where uh, I understood what's the difference between a lead supervisor level and and director level. Lead supervisor, yeah. I, I you know you need to get your hands dirty. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to provide proper you know technical support and best practice and all that. When you're more on the director level, you're in constant meeting with other department. You're dealing with HR. You're dealing with scheduling and budget. So you, you become more of a AF producer, AF super supervisor. Uh, and some and sometime um, you just don't have the opportunity to to animate anymore. So yeah. I would say I, I kind of witness all, all the people that that, that work with uh, uh, mocap in, uh, instead of uh, keyframe. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not something that I experienced. Myself. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I get that, man. Like that's exactly how I'm I'm, I'm at at the moment. Um, and as you said, it makes complete sense. Like when you actually get to actually direct the team, and you have to hire, and you have to form, and you have to plan, and you have to manage. Like you genuinely mm -hmm. don't have time to animate. And um, no, for me, as a thing. For for me, it hasn't been really that long so far because I've been at to build a rocket boy for a year, but I miss it. I for sure miss it, and uh, I'm thankful that I have my YouTube channel to maybe actually try some things. But uh, at work, work, it's very difficult for me to find time to actually kind of uh, animate. So I get what you mean, and uh, it's kind of sad, but it's part of the yeah. job, right? Well, uh, yeah, exactly. It's part of the job. When you get to that level, you understand that you know your own happiness level is not really what matters. It's really the project and what your department and your team brings uh, on the table, and. Well, you might want to enjoy putting your headphone in Animate for a couple hours, but no, you need to go and yeah. deal with all of those fires with other departments. You need to figure out where, uh, what is the production schedule, where are we going to find those resources that, that we need. So you kind of forget a, a little bit about your own preference of what you'd like to do on a day-to-day, -day, uh, and you focus more like, okay, how do we sell this ship? And That's remain it. sane, and you know, hopefully that we don't eat each other by the end. We're kind of do all we can to make the ride as enjoyable as we can for everyone. And yep. usually, for the director, it doesn't always involve animating. Completely. Like so, my highlight of the days when I can get it uh, normally once or twice a week is reviewing animation. When mm -hmm. I go, I like this. I don't like this. 
doing notes in animation. That's that's when I actually uh, shine at work. <laughs> that's yeah. as close as I can get to animation. But I don't do, actually do the animations. It's my animators, and uh, they are, they are brilliant. They are really talented. But uh, that's that's when I get my animation fix. Everything else outside of that is just management and dealing with fires, as you mentioned, which is yeah. uh, it's challenging, but it's part of the job. You're right, and, and that's something that uh, I have been able to enjoy during this time to uh, supervise. And I was also giving iAnimate class on, on the side, so you know that was kind of my uh, my link to animation. I was able to give notes, supervise, uh, try to help the team to raise the uh, qual uh, quality bar, uh, bring all this experience that I had from animated uh, feature, both at DreamWorks, Animal Logic, uh, uh, Double Negative, and kind of bring a little bit. And that's the reason the, the studio thought about me in the first place, that, OK, we're mm -hmm. going to get someone that knows how to create animation to, to that level and hopefully be able to bring a little bit uh, uh, of it um, as it, with the uh, a game because you know uh, yeah. even now it's hard to compare the the level of quality of uh, animation between a Pixar movie and most of the the the, the game for, for sure. a lot of different reason yeah. but it felt that if we have someone that is able to bring this yeah. kind of you know essence to the to to the studio that's going to to help for sure that's amazing and um i wanted to kind of like pivot a little bit even though i think we need to come back to some of the aaron's questions because they are really good but uh, i wanted to talk a little bit about agora so like mm. you obviously you did your section of time or you actually did film and then you actually did obviously games as well and then i'm guessing you jumped out of games and actually went over to actually build your own business am i right not exactly um no it's actually been a long transition. It's not mm -hmm. being a jumping. So uh, what happened is, so let's go back 15 years ago. I'm coming back from France. Uh, mm -hmm. The studio actually enjoyed working with me, and they sent me this little contract that I do in remote freelancing. This is uh, fall 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the end of it, I was like, huh. That worked well. Uh, I guess we could build a studio where everyone is working from anywhere, mm -hmm. and maybe eventually we'll be able to do CG animation on a laptop, maybe on the beach. Or so you know, that's kind of the crazy idea of maybe one day a virtual studio might be something. Mm -hmm. So the idea has been there for the, the longest time. Fast forward when I, I was at uh, Ada's, the, the Montreal, it, the, the market is just insane. So a shortage of you know good resources. So at some point I was like, okay, I need to a, a solution. So uh, remote freelancing became this solution. So I started to reach out and hire animators uh, in remote and learn for uh, quite some time to, okay, how to manage communication, time zone, what kind of tool are we going to use for? So basically figure out the entire uh, workflow, an efficient workflow to be able to work with those people that are not mm -hmm. on site. It, it feels ridiculous to talk about it, especially nowadays, but yeah. eight years ago, it was still <laughs> not something that everyone yeah. was used to. Um, after a little, little while, it kind of it kind of worked, and then uh, because I had a big network of connection in Montreal, uh, studio started to. Uh, are you available? No. Well, do you know people that are available? Not really. But if you're willing to go with remote freelancing, I know that there's a lot of your your pool of resources. So I kind of been the yeah. uh, evangelist of remote freelancing, but with no business and you no you know anything mm -hmm. else than sharing what uh, what I was experimenting mm -hmm. uh, and eventually there's a studio that said could you actually find the people and supervise them and manage them and i said sure let, let me try so night and weekend i was doing it uh and it lasted a month you know super mm -hmm. small project but at the end of it the client was happy the studio was happy uh the animators were happy to have this little sideline in fun and fun and i was like huh, okay maybe there's something there so one thing led to another, and eventually we started to have a name for the company and a website and partners that started to join in. So it was kind of growing, but I was still working full time at ADAS. It was okay. kind of my second like a side I made, gig. Yeah, I animate and uh, Agora remain a side gig for at least three or four years. So okay. it very, very slowly grew, and by the end of Tomb Raider, 
it joined a it reached a, uh, a breaking point of you know obviously exhausted uh, at the end of any big triple a game sure. and i had those two side business on the side so that was after a two month sabbatical i said okay uh, i announced to ados that i was not going to quit but i need to go part-time yeah uh, because I need to, I created this monster that needs to be fed and yeah. I, I just need to, to, to do it. Yeah. Um, and so on a six month period went from like three days a week to, sorry guys, I, I, I really don't have time uh, anymore. So it was a very gradual and it's uh, October of, um, when, when are we? Yeah, it, it's, it's a year ago uh, or, uh, or uh, that we, um, a year and a half ago uh, that uh, I made the transition to go full-time with uh, Agora because the growth was super fast. Yeah, that's uh, great. And, yeah, I've been riding this wild beast since then. <laughs> <laughs> but it hasn't been that long. I thought it was going to, it was go, it was longer because of mm. like, you know, how much exposure you guys are getting, how much love you guys are getting in the, in the industry. So it's been, um, it's been like a, a really a passion project that turned into like a business, right? More than anything. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, none of us plan to, okay, let's create a business. What do we yeah. do? No, it, it's the opposite. Like, oh, and it's it's something that you just pull your finger and the next thing you know, you have your inner half of your body that is stuck in the engine. And that's <laughs> like, okay, well, I guess that we're, go we're going to do it. So yeah. none of us uh, were, you know, uh, business people or uh, thought of creating a company. We're all, we're all artists and technicians uh, from the uh, uh, industry. So yeah. So that definitely impact the culture that we have uh, within uh, Agora and the relationship that we have with clients because all of us uh, have been on their side. We've all been in studio that was either dealing with vendors or dealing with freelancers or you know artists and all that. So we know we know that what they're going through when a yeah. production doesn't uh, go well, whether it's our uh, we're involved in this situation or, or not. So that kind of helped to talk the same language and be uh, empathetic. Uh, with, with the, yeah, I, I get it. Going through. I get it. Yeah. Like when you actually go through a few years of experience, then you actually start seeing like motions of, of like the same thing happening in different studios and definitely going freelance, especially nowadays, right? With, with COVID and everyone working from home, I think he's making, yeah. he's making more sense than ever. Yeah, COVID has been very, I mean, in the beginning, like uh, everyone like, holy shit, okay, what, what's going to happen? There was this <laughs> phase of, are we, I mean, we're still a startup. Uh, we don't have like millions at the bank. So what happens if there's no contract all of a sudden for like a year? Can we survive? So there was all yeah. of those questions. Uh, the impact was relative, uh, you know, it was not big for, uh, for us, for, fortunately. But I would say it did two things. What, one was very positive and the other one was slightly negative uh this the slightly negative is that our best selling point for freelance for artists in general is like hey you want to work from home we have a solution for you oh i it's see it's pretty hard to, <laughs> to, to uh, use that selling point uh, nowadays yeah. so i would say out of the 10 thing that we used to say well this is this, this the number one is like okay let's scratch this one and let's focus yeah. let's start at number two and, and go down the list yeah. uh but on the other side um the even a year and a half ago, just before, uh, there was still I was still facing a lot of resistance from a lot of students. They're like, uh, we're not sure how can it be secured. How do we know that people are not paid and are just watching Netflix and all of this psychological fear of the unknown, basically. Uh, it's, it's funny I don't know because... where you. I, I look around and my people are there. How yeah, can exactly. It work if the people are not there. It's funny because no one is talking about that anymore because because things are working. <laughs> Yeah. But before so, now, everyone was like, yeah, you're not going to work. So you have to come to the office. Yeah, that, that made me gain at least a couple hours in my week that I don't have to explain why it's working. And it it kind of got us like a decade of mainstream acceptance that, yeah. okay, work in remote can work. There's a way to make it work. It can be a disaster if it's not managed properly. But if it is managed properly, it's actually a very efficient solution. I would not tell any studio to send 100% of their production in remote. There's some stuff that is if uh, that you can do very well in remote. There's other stuff, not so much because there's so much data transfer. Yeah. Uh, but I think the more it goes, the more studio. I see the industry evolving as most of the studio are going to keep a very strong 
core team mm -hmm. uh, of creative and technician. And each time, you know, production is doing this, each time you're at the top of the curve, but, oh, okay, yeah, we actually need four more animators for two months there. Boom, bring the, the freelancers, ideally people that we work with in the past. All right, it's finished. Thank you. We continue with the... So it's going yeah. to be a mix of working with our own core team and working with those freelancers or vendors or other uh, people that are not physically here. <laughs> Yeah, it makes complete sense. I think I think games does a lot of that already. They they kind of expand contracting towards the end of the project, right? Because they have to actually yeah. add another hundred people on top of the project, and then they actually let let go of them. And um, I remember a few years back, everyone used to think that was the most cruel thing, <laughs> because uh, especially when I was working for Microsoft, everyone was like, everyone wants to work for Microsoft, and then Microsoft would hire as a contractor. And then, like you know, throw you out in the end. But uh, that was actually <laughs> a good thing because I yeah. started doing that. I started contracting, and it turns out that you can actually uh, learn quite a lot of valuable lessons, like building your own business and having a limited company and invoicing people, and and you just get to learn a little bit about how it, how it is to be independent and work for yourself and extra getting extra money and all that good stuff. Yeah, for sure. I would say for me, it was it, maybe it's a little bit natural because when I got out of school, you know, you were not hired forever. There was maybe Ubisoft and tour and Ubisoft was like a 250 employees uh, yep. back in the day, which was by far the biggest studio uh, in town in town. But, you know, you were hired for a project. It was yeah. you, even if you were an employee. Oh, that project is four months. OK, I'm going to start to look for another job. And, you know, all of those gig until Actually, until I got to, to DreamWorks, we're mm -hmm. all like, okay, that movie, that movie, this series, this thing, this thing, and and moving on. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's definitely maybe some people that want to prefer the peace of mind of, okay, I'm going to be there. And for them, it's comforting that I'm still going to be there five years from, from now, and, and it's fine. Uh, but I think there's more and more a... a realization that it's an ecosystem sometimes you can go work for a studio x amount yeah. of time then you need a two-month sabbatical then you're going to freelance a little bit then you're going to work again or oh, need a little bit more money maybe going to freelance 15 hours on the side and people exactly. realize that okay now all of the options are out there so it's everyone to choose what they prefer to, uh, to yeah it's, it, it's a beautiful thing i really hope that that's the future i don't see why not especially given how how like this actually the benefit of this which is everything is bad except for this for the covid is exactly that i think it's just like the world is going to be a very different place and people are going to be much more independent and have more options especially in the industry that you have to jump around so much like yeah. then the, normally, like when you're young, and you probably can relate to this, when you're young and you're 20 years old, you think I can go and work in Australia, I can go and work in LA, I can work work in Canada. I'm gonna go to all these places if I can because I can get paid and I get accommodation and relocation. Yeah. But when when you get to your mid 30s, 40s, and you have a family and you have to actually kind of a settle, then it becomes difficult to do those things, and and it's it's hard. It's hard to justify. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you know that that's a that's a big shift in the industry. And it's not just going to affect it's not just affecting the animation industry, it's affecting a lot of industry. Everyone on the southern woke up and say, Oh, we can actually work in remote. And you know, I all the studios that I work with, there's a general consensus, right? Or mm -hmm. at least everyone that I, I spoke with that um there's twenty percent of the employees that never want to go back to the studio ever again. Yeah. There's 20 percent that never want to be working from home ever again. That's right. And there's 60 percent that are going to expect flexibility. Yeah. I'm going to be two or three days at work. I'm going to go work the rest of the time at. So it's it's a big shift in the industry. And you know, there's like any shift. There's there's uh, there's two sides of, of the middle there's big advantage but there's there's going to be big challenge as well i'm thinking and that's something that i i'm talking openly because i'm casting on so many projects you know sure. when when you we get into a reality that studios will be able to have access to anyone on the planet and yes there's time zones yes there's culture yes there's language barrier there, there's all of those things um but you know uh, English being mainly the universal uh, uh, language, when most of the studios say, okay, now I need to ramp up, um, they're going to go for the best artists they can have for their, for their money. It doesn't Optimism. mean that they're going to go for cheap labor or automatically, but you know, if you're currently living, for instance, in 
downtown New York and you yeah. pay like 4,000 for per month for your little apartment and you're charging a salary in US dollar, yeah. you're not going to run out of work, but just understand that you are now in competition with all those other people that might live in the countryside in country that have lower currency. And for sure. you might be on par in terms of experience and skills, but they are less than half yeah, the price than you are only yeah. because of the cost of living of where you, you are living. And so that's just a reality that people will need to start to think about. Completely, completely. Especially when the level of talent is the same, because obviously talent comes from anywhere. Mm -hmm. Then it's hard to justify paying someone in New York more than someone that is actually somewhere else that's slightly cheaper with cheap better rates when they can give you the same amount of work uh, at the same quality, right? Well, it used to make sense in a time that, you know, there was a few good school, you know, you had mm -hmm. uh, CalArts, uh, for instance, you had the Goblin, you had Sheridan, and those schools used to be in those center where life is more uh, expensive and, you know, good education, bring good, uh, uh, you know, Better students talents. that you, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the talent kind of fold, but... Yeah. You know, we already talked about uh, an admission mentor, how they break them all, and then the I animate and anime school and all those others. Yeah. So it means that literally now you can be at the far end of the jungle as long as you have internet, you can be mentored good to go. by exactly. the best. Uh, so that's a thing. And now mm -hmm. on top of that studio from anywhere can hire those people that already had amazing education by those animators that are in that studio. So For sure. it's not going to be overnight, but you know, the next decade is going yeah. to slowly go uh, become, make this become a reality. For sure. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I would like to talk about your your, your website though, because Agora Studio. Mm -hmm. I have to say, for, first and foremost, the website is amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's really cool. Like that was the first thing. Like when I asked to kind of find you guys for the first time, I was like, "Wow, this is a cool website." Um, awesome. But uh, so I know that, as you mentioned before, just before, so we don't run out of time, like you actually obviously do this amazing work, remote, lots of different companies and all that stuff. But um, Agora community is actually mm -hmm. like uh, something that I found incredibly interesting. And uh, once again, thanks a lot for, for the invite. And I think that this is going to, has the potential to be huge. And uh, the fact that you guys are gathering so many um, great talent and the one community and like, sharing the knowledge and with this cool website as well. Yeah. How did it come about? How, how did the idea come about? Um, the, the, it's a mix of many different things. Uh, first of all, I think, um, I think when you get to a certain level of, you know, we often have this uh, uh, imposter syndrome as animator. I don't know why, but we all feel that we don't deserve to be in those big studios. And Completely. All that. And at some point when you have like 20 years of experience um, and you've been doing good and you're fine and you, you, you uh, this feeling of, you know, uh, paying it forward and contribute to the uh, industry, it's something that you have a hard time to put words on it, but you, <clears throat> you feel... I remember that when I started to teach at iAnimate, when I had a ex students of mine that, that came back two years after to email me and say, dude, you have no idea how much you made a difference. I now have a job I can provide for my family and all that. This feeling that, that you have when you feel that you contribute uh, uh, is... So, so that's something that we've been talking for, for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, what the, the, the trigger was really the beginning of the pandemic at a point that, you know, there was the early, what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. And then the, okay, is everyone safe? And then it's going to be the beginning of this, okay, well, what do we do with all this time and how can we contribute to uh, mm -hmm. to it? So we started with uh, uh, Agra Studio that we did this um, like 20 or 25 uh, video series of, okay, well, now that you're all stuck, stuck at home, uh, we've been doing this for five years. So we had a lot of our freelancers that, uh, okay, Today, um, I'm going to talk about why uh, it's good to exercise, what should be a good mo morning routine, uh, why it's a good idea to still take a shower even if you're working from home, what tools you can use to be more efficient. So we kind of started with uh, with that, but very rapidly after there was this idea that I was talking with uh, Brent, uh, George, that's also uh, involved with uh, uh, Agra Community mm -hmm. uh, about this idea. And it started with... Um, that would be great. I mean, there's all those amazing uh, online school already. There's that this is covered. Um, but maybe there could be a demand just for people that want to have affordable feedback for their yeah. uh, animation. 
And once we have their, their feedback, maybe they won't mind if we share it with the rest of the community. So mm -hmm. maybe we could have, you know, a way to take all of those reviews and put them in a library. So anyone, if you, even if you're not ordering a review yourself, you can benefit from hundreds of hours of reviews from top animators on, on those. And then, well, since we're going to build a library, why not start to create, uh, uh, you know, content for it or... Mm -hmm. And this is when we started to reach out, uh, uh, you know, to uh, to the Sir Wade and Jean Denis and yourself and a lot of others. And many said, "That's an amazing idea." By yeah. the way, I have all those video on the side that I'll be <laughs> waiting to put. So all of a sudden, like, okay, I guess we could do it. And then we build a tagging system. So if you you click on body mechanic, any video that is related to body mechanic is going to be there and you can go to yeah. interview or to, you know, animation curve and all of that. So it kind of grew very organically uh, over time. And now with the 24 anim, anim challenge this weekend, yeah. uh, we're kind of going into this new era of now, okay, let's now try to make it as interactive as uh, possible. Exactly. No, this is uh, this is really cool. I'm excited uh, for this. Um, really excited. Uh, there's quite a few people like hosting and like uh, being guests and stuff like that. And uh, how did the idea of the 24 hour like? It's, I mean, it's it's a great idea, but like, how did it actually came up came about? And like, how did you guys put it all together? <laughs> it's uh, you know, there's one. There was having the idea, and there's actually choosing to execute on the idea and then deal with all the different logistic and, uh, and everything. Yeah. Um, it's uh, uh, Veronica, one of the, uh, that is in the uh, team and uh, that she's doing a lot of the frame by frame uh, footage that we're sharing and, and all that. She participated herself uh, to a, a 24 hour challenge. It used to be at a school, but COVID. So it was a online 24 hour uh, challenge. And at the end of it, she just, you know, just casually told us about the experience. And I think there's a few light bulbs that just uh, appears like, holy shit, we we already have connections with a lot of people. We already have the Anim Challenge that is doing really well. Mm -hmm. That's something that sounds very interesting. We want to start to do those live events. Uh, let's throw a 24-hour challenge and see how it goes. So we started to reach out to most of the, the the name and there's many more people that unfortunately were not uh, available but maybe on the second uh, yeah. if there's a second challenge so i would say the enthusiasm of people that we reached out uh, just fueled our own motivation to to do it so That's we started great. i think it was two or three months ago to talk about it and we had the okay february 1st uh that's our deadline do, do we announce it do we do it or not and by that time we were all tokens like all right let's let's do it let's do it <laughs> that's really cool <laughs> like for example aaron here um he actually mentioned to me already but he's part participating on the 24 hours challenge and i expect great things <laughs> <laughs> i'm pretty sure yeah he's gonna have a, a badass team to actually kind of join in as well so it's going to be great yeah th that's going to be awesome i i, I mean I, i'm 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 super stoked for for uh, for this kind of uh, of project and you know this is yeah. when it, it's coming from just from passion for animation and and just seeing all of the amazing work that is coming from the anim channel and again just see everyone uh you know drive uh, and motivation to to do it it's kind of fueling ourselves to say okay well now we let's uh, so let's stream for 24 hours and let's do this and let's do this and let's build a custom 3d trophy with a frame of the the, the winner and all those crazy ideas that that's just great piled on top of so, each other. so so the winners get a 3d trophy is that what they get that's for the uh, the solo section so those that that's go cool. uh, by themselves that's going to be uh, so we wanted to that, that's a, one of the crazy ideas of like, all right, let's let's do it. We have two <laughs> super, you know, talent, uh, talented uh, uh, people um, that are going to work on the trophy, 3D printed, and then end uh, uh, um, um, paint it. That's uh, great. And then after that, because we we want to you know leverage as much as we can, uh, we're actually they're actually going to record the process. And then we can put this process in the library. So if people want uh, to 3D print their own trophy, we'll have the kind of making of uh, uh, of those trophy that's going to be accessible in the library uh, afterwards. So it, it's, uh, everything is connected some, somehow. So this is why yeah. it's super inspiring and motivating. 
That is cool. That is really cool. Yeah, no, I think um, I think like with 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 things like this, I think this is exactly what the community needs to actually kind of have some kind of like something to do because I feel I feel like with everyone staying at home for a long time, yeah. I feel like a lot of people get into that vein of like because we are all at home we shouldn't do anything in our spare time because there's so much netflix and distraction and games and all that stuff i think if you actually want to be an animator or aspire to be an animator or maybe you are already but you need to see a little side gig and you're bored these kind of challenges are perfect because it gives you something else to actually kind of just like spend at least a few days working on so it's great stuff yeah, and it's one thing to interact with people, but it's another thing also to feel that you are part of something, even if yeah. it's just 24 hours. And for us, like, okay, the Anim Challenge are all doing it individual on their side. Now we are allowing that you can create teams so you interact with each other. And we're going to try to make it as dynamic as possible to go as we're streaming. Hey, how are you doing? Oh my God, I'm struggling. I just restarted my. So just to have this, you know, feeling that uh, they're all in it. To, together and by the end whether you're happy or not with your animation you will have had a good time along exactly the way. exactly and you get to meet other people by the chromosome actually chromosome actually added the link i'm just putting it out here so people know exactly where to go mm -hmm. the challenge is tomorrow or uh, it starts for tomorrow right oh no tomorrow uh, no, it, uh, no it, it's starting uh saturday at uh, noon uh, pst so yes, uh, exactly. so it's it's from saturday at noon to sunday uh, yeah, noon. PST, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So we're going to start to stream an hour before the the, the challenge. Then the challenge theme is going to be announced at uh, noon. And then it's go, go, go for everyone in the for app everybody. until yeah, they have 24 hours to submit their animation. All of the animation are going to be on a custom page on uh, Agra Community. So everyone mm -hmm. will be able to see it. Uh, and we're also going to have an audience uh, award. So basically, we'll have a grading system, uh, uh, thumbs up to thumbs down. So uh, we'll maybe wait a week. So you know whoever has the most thumbs down uh, is going to win this specific prize uh, on the side of the judge prize that we have as well. Yeah, I'll I'll be keeping an eye on that because I'm very interested to see uh, to see the uh, interest. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be giving a lot of thumbs up and thumbs down, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. For, for those that want to join me, by the way, I actually like self plug, but I actually kind of I'm going to be hosting for two hours um, at two a.m. PST, which is going to be ten at uh, ten p.m. GMT to about twelve. <laughs> you you have no idea how much our brain melted in the past week just trying to yeah. figure out. Okay, that's in PST. Is in Europe. <laughs> what is the time of the host who's actually on the East Coast? And <laughs> we'll need a better system for that because we was, I was died, I, right? <laughs> I was making everything more difficult for the because of where I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, not you. I mean, we have a lot of people that are in different time zones. So whether it's six yeah. hours ahead of time or just two hours, it's it doesn't yeah. make it uh, easier. But you know, th thanks for your generous oh. to come and participate. No. No problem, no problem. Like I know Ed Hooks is actually in Lisbon, Portugal, which is in the same time zone, zone as I am. So it kind of mm -hmm. makes sense that he actually goes a little later as well. Um, so it makes complete sense. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and I, th I think that the, the setup is going to be like this. So everyone can actually communicate and comment and all that stuff, which is going to be Excellent. Yeah. You know, it's the first one. So there's some stuff that will go amazingly well, and there'll be other stuff that will totally fail. But we're going to have fun. Uh, we're going to definitely learn from the experience. And if we see that, okay, it's been successful uh, enough, definitely we're going to think about what is the next iteration. But I don't have the specific numbers yet. But when Veronica told me yesterday how many people uh, had subscribed, I was impressed. Uh, yeah. There, there's a lot of people. <laughs> that That's amazing. For this challenge, so yeah. <laughs> so uh, so people like Aaron and Chromosome have a lot of uh, a lot of competition. So you guys heard it here first. <laughs> yep, exactly. And it's from all level. This is what is amazing. I mean, there's yeah. literally students, amateur, but there's also people that have like 15 years of experience in the industry. So That's maybe great. eventually we'll have different categories. Yeah. Uh, but right now it's just like. All right, let's, Everyone. let's see, let's see yeah. how it goes. It, it, it still amazes me that people with that many experience will 
take the time to, yep, I'm not going to sleep the entire weekend to participate to this kind of challenge. It's amazing. Exactly, exactly. See, one of my, one of my more, most uh, cherished um, memories is uh, I actually participated in 24 hours. I import, like when I was uh, back home, Portugal many years back. Um, I used to actually practice capoeira. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. these Brazilian martial yeah. arts things. Yeah. So in, in order to get my my rope at that point, I actually had to participate in an event. There was 24 hours of capoeira with different schools. So all kinds of schools got together and then a gym, gymnasium. And then basically we just like did it. And it was not to actually win anything or do anything. It was just get the rope in the end just to prove that you did it and you have big eye bags. But besides that, <laughs> it was just fun. And you just got to hang out with your mates and talk about rubbish and it was amazing and um mm -hmm. i hope the same is true here i know that we're doing all virtually but i think it's actually something special for you to actually be there strong for 24 hours yeah uh, it's people it's it's an experience that people won't forget for sure yeah. because it, for so many reasons but you go through all of those stages of super motivated and then start to have the little fatigue and even in animation you super stuck in the blo blocking you super stuck in final polishing but in between like oh my god what's going on and <laughs> but on top of that you have sleep deprivation so there was actually a little list of make sure you hydrate make sure you take a break you can Great. you can go and shower to refresh after x amount so there was those kind of very casual you know, yeah. take care of yourself because it's uh, by the end of it, you're going to be adrenaline is going to kick in and then you're going yeah. to crash a few hours after it. That's oh, yeah, exactly. But anyone that has a, actually either done university or worked uh, in a studio that actually kind of works a little too hard, most likely has gone through it. So um, I guess it's, it's, it's the same, but just for a good reason, because mm -hmm. you're doing it for yourself. So there's nothing better. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean... This is great. Uh, I really appreciate you actually coming over, David, to actually kind of share your experience. Uh, Thank I don't want to take Thank you. No Thanks problem. For inviting me. No problem. Thanks a lot for making it. And it, like I know it's been an hour now, and I don't want to take too much of your time because uh, obviously you're a busy guy. But uh, I'm looking forward to joining you guys on Saturday for this yeah. 24 hours animation challenge. And uh, yeah, I hope we actually get to talk more and like get to see more of you uh, around. I'm pretty sure I will. Yeah, and I'll take the uh, opportunity to plug that with Agora community, we're going to start to do the, the, the same thing, those, uh, uh, you know, roundtable uh, discussion and interview stream and in the library as well. And you'll obviously be one of our uh, first guests. So hopefully Thanks. in a few weeks, we have a follow up discussion and we'll be able to uh, to share yeah. about this, uh, this experience. Exactly, exactly. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. So yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot for everyone in the comments. Uh, there was a lot of quite qu good questions that we didn't get to answer, but it's a sign of a good chat when people are interested in asking good questions. So thanks a lot in the chat. Thanks a lot to everyone in the chat. And uh, yeah, David, have a great rest of the week, man. Thank you, man. <laughs> Speak to you later. Bye-bye, guys. Take care.